All right, welcome to the first off week of the farm residency. Uh, thanks for joining me last week if you were live for Grand Rounds. Uh, yeah, so I thought it would be interesting. I don't know, hopefully you, everybody takes something away from it. To basically track over, so we have six weeks of these off weeks. Um, and I'm game again to add anything in based on questions or uh, just kind of wants uh, from all of you. But I thought it'd be cool to track our entire business uh, kind of progress over the last uh, almost nine years. So I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to share a screen with you real quick um, so you can just kind of see this. But if you see this article, this is out of our little local newspaper, not even like the Birmingham newspaper, just kind of local to our area. Um, but this is Sloan and I um, back in the day in our super small office, uh, less than 1,200 square feet. Um, we started our office, uh, started uh, Valentine's Day of 2014. Uh, let me go ahead and back out of that. But yeah, this was some free press. We'll talk about that here in a second. Um, how did that all happen? So you may have heard part of this story before, and I apologize if this is uh, repetitive, but the breakdown was that basically Sloan moved down here and there's a whole story how we landed in Birmingham, which got us some free press too. It's in here of uh, breaking down on the highway and um, kind of all these interesting parts of story that added to the whole story of the farm. But from the business side, Sloan came down and had a job with a a practice um, and did her master's residency at the same time while I did my master's residency uh, back in Illinois. And then we both had jobs lined up at this practice. So Sloan is technically already working at this practice. And I moved down in October of 2013, uh, graduated in August uh, to start my first day of work. And I show up to this office. And when I come in, I am abruptly told that we no longer have, they no longer have a job for me. And I was pretty taken back. I just moved to Birmingham and, you know, that's not awesome to think that you have a job and then all of a sudden you don't. Well, at the same time, it had, it started becoming uh, clear that this office was not what a, uh, they had made it out to be. Sloan was seeing about 70 people a day. Um, so this was not our style of office. The whole goal of a residency was they had every rehab piece of equipment you could ever imagine. She was supposed to design this kind of rehab side of the practice, but it was really just a mill. Um, a lot of things went south there. Um, I'll talk about maybe uh, how to s stick to your guns with uh, uh, knowing uh, finances here in a second with that. But uh, lo and behold, we started uh, kind of freaking out. So I visited every chiropractor in Birmingham. I went in, I don't, at the time, there were 37 chiropractors and everybody was pretty amicable. A couple of people offered for me to rent office space. Uh, but I quickly realized there's no way I'm going to be able to practice the way I want to practice if I just kind of kowtow. Now, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. But for whatever reason, I just kind of kept pushing back on like, uh, I could go into this office and rent space two days a week or whatever it was. So Sloan comes home from work one day and I was like, I think we need to open our own practice. And she's like, ah, oh, that's crazy. And she kind of, you know, retorts back with, well, you know, we had the option to buy this practice when both of us were going to be working here. Let's see if we can just still buy the practice instead of, you know, us having jobs. So we start talking to him about that again and you know they give us a price and the price that they gave us was eight hundred thousand dollars which is really expensive for a practice now in that price i assumed um this was a very nice building uh i want to say like a seven thousand five thousand square foot building uh with an adjoining lot that had nothing on it i assumed the real estate was part of the deal well assumptions you know what um, they say about those <clears throat> so real quick here Um, so I keep calling for their, uh, financial work, right? I want to see the P and L I want to see, uh, you know, basically everything I need to see. Why are you putting the price tag on this thing? Uh, they won't give up any financial records, which again, another red flag. So finally, uh, Sloan is kind of threatening there that she's going to quit and all these things and they're keep coming at us. So do we want to buy the practice? And, um, I said, the only way that we're going to buy the practice or have the option of buying the practice, is if we actually have a meeting with you and your accountant. So they set it up and we show up to this meeting and we're sitting around the conference room table and their accountant, I mean, it's all of us. He just literally hands me the paperwork when we walk in 
and I start reading it and I, I mean, extri- like super easy to see that they're in debt for almost the exact amount of money, actually more than they were asking us for buy, to buy the practice for. So they were literally just asking us to debt leverage them um, out of debt. And the other part of this was that the building and real estate was not part of the deal. So they basically wanted us to pay the mortgage for the building um, and not have the real estate in the land. So then when I got down to brass tax, which when you're, and this is, there's a lot of conjecture here, but when you're valuating a business, but a practice in particular, you basically take gross revenue um, and you can multiply that by three. And that kind of gives you, or sorry, not gross revenue. uh, Yeah, gross revenue, multiply that by three. And that might give you like a starting number to operate from uh, or one and a half times, sorry, not three. Uh, so let's say you have 300,000 and multiply it by one and a half and I got 450,000, uh, maybe a decent thing or a decent, uh, asking number. Well, this was nowhere near $800,000. So I retort back that, Hey, the most I'm going to be paying for this practice, even with some brand equity, which brand equity is very, uh, stands on shaky ground was about $400,000. And obviously they balked at that. And I, we walked out of the meeting or I was done with the meeting basically saying, well, you can, you know, shove it. Their accountant literally stopped me after the meeting was like, I'm so glad that you knew what to look for, stood up for yourself and called for this meeting over and over before getting into bed with them because they're like extremely corrupt people. So there again, we didn't need a red flag. Somebody literally, literally told us, uh, these are crooks. Uh, don't want to call anybody out, but they also ran some people's insurance without actually seeing them. So they're literally committing insurance fraud, good uh, practice to get out. So now it's solidified that uh, we've had this meeting. Sloan's like, I've got to get out of this job, but obviously we need money. Um, we just, you know, graduated. So she's like, I'm going to keep working here, but um, I guess how are we going to do this uh, business thing? So here's the, the process or the starting of the farm. So at the time in school in St. Louis, I banked with PNC Bank, who now just took over BBVA is getting even bigger. Uh, so I walk into PNC one day and I ask somebody, hey, I need to apply for a business loan. They're like, okay. So I fill out an application and you know they just have me wait <clears throat> and they come back and they go, hey, you know, bad news is we can't offer you a business loan. Good news is we can offer you a credit line I was like, okay. And they're like, of $10,000. Now, um, our last extern just went to open in a very small town in Illinois. I don't think he'd mind me telling you that he had to take out a loan of just like $25,000. So $10,000 isn't super far away from that. Our business plan called for startup costs uh, with, since both of us, two, uh, both household incomes would be in a business that obviously you have to live. So some of that's being pulled out for the, what the projected time frame is the first six months. We had that projected at $100,000, right? That's paying for uh, rent deposits, equipment, software, us. I mean, everything, right? For up to the first six months is what you're projecting. Um, so we, I, look at PNC and I was like, well, you know what? I'm not going to turn down the credit line, but that's not enough. So then I start going through this massive process of, well, how am I going to do this? Well, luckily there's a group here and really everywhere that's a nonprofit called the SBD- SBDCA. So that for us is a small business and development group of Alabama or GA um, group of Alabama. Yeah. But it's run via a nonprofit through the university of Alabama. And the guy that ran it is a lawyer at the time was a lawyer. And he basically led us down the path of the small business administration loan process, which is a nightmare. You want to talk about more paperwork you've ever done in your life? Like I thought a mortgage was bad. SBA is 10 times worse. So we do this SBA loan process. It's just so many dotting I's and crossing T's, but we do get approved for $100,000. And which to us, we're just like, oh my God, that's so much money. I can't believe this happened. They're like, we felt like we're getting away with something. They're giving these kids a uh, hundred grand to go play and, you know, play business. So by this time, it's probably uh, November at some point. So we start looking at how soon could we open? Well, uh, a lot of swings of fate went our way during this time. The fact that we ended up in Birmingham by breaking down the highway, um, kind of this bad luck of this practice going south that forced us into the farm. Another good swing of fate, which was a huge one, 
was uh, one of the front front desk uh, workers, Bridget, who is now our office manager, basically came up to Sloan when she knew that Sloan was leaving. It was like, I've got to get out of here. Like she, you know, writing was on the wall. This is not a good practice. So she said, I want to come work for you. Well, we had already decided that we couldn't af can't afford staff, right? There's two of us. So we could just work off hours, right? All scheduled patients. Um, or when I have patients, Sloan won't have patients and vice versa. And we'll just work the desk and the phones, And that's how we're going to do it. Well, then we have this opportunity to get somebody that Bridget had worked in a previous medical practice on this chiropractic practice. They use ChiroTouch, so she knew some of the software that we we're going to be using. So it was kind of one of those things that was hard to pass up. Now, we had not projected that into the 100000 So we said, we're just going to have to strap down. So whatever we thought we were going to pull out for our, you know, basically paying apartment rent and food and stuff, is just going to have to go down, um, which is not the easiest thing to do. Um, and can really start to stress you out. But here's an interesting thing, and I, I can't explain this from any type of like hard data. The whole time I was going through this process, Sloan, not so much, she'll tell you, um, I had no doubt or worry. Now, maybe my subconscious just like wouldn't let me go there. So it just like flipped the switch and I went all like Goggins and was like, nah, can't fail. Even though the possibility was high all the time. Uh, but yeah, I just had no doubt the whole time that we weren't doing the right thing. So. We get the loan, we start going through the process of, I mean, buying equipment as cheap as we can. We bought used tables. We found a, a old, a warehouse downtown that was full of old medical equipment that we got PT tables and reupholstered chiropractic tables. Uh, I think our biggest purchase, uh, we bought ChiroTouch or we, you know, we did payments, but at the time you paid for these things versus the cloud, which hindsight's 2020 and cloud-based software largely didn't exist it was mac practice and i mean jane was not existent we'll talk about software maybe at a later date uh but we bought cairo touch which we didn't pay for you had to pay 2500 up front and then we bought a vibe plate which a lot of people are like why the hell did you buy that up front uh i don't know i think i think in my eyes we needed a couple like whiz bang things that nobody had and like i know that sounds funny but like nobody had that and like they are highly effective, especially a vibe plate. It's just kind of unidirectional vibration versus a triplanar vibration. So anyways, that being said, we were in an 1,198 square foot office. Now office location, I sc scoured the Birmingham area um, for, you know, conjunctions of, you know, what's the best uh, geographic location from traffic flow, uh, obviously looking at demographic data. I was a marketing major in undergrad and had to do a massive de demographic study for my graduate project for Remax Realty. So that kind of helped me in this process. Uh, I scoured the area and ended up uh, where we're at, which is basically east of Birmingham on Highway 280. And we're still in Birmingham, but we're right on the edge of Birmingham. And it's kind of over this area that they call it over the mountain. So if you've ever been to our office, you know that you go over the, I don't call it a mountain, it's a big hill. You go over this big hill and it's kind of the psychologic barrier between like Birmingham proper and getting out into the country, even though it's not the country. It's kind of actually the mo one of the most affluent areas in Birmingham, one of the reasons we chose it. But there wasn't a whole lot of businesses out here, right? Uh, so we went into this double decker building, which is where that picture I showed you was taken. We were in the lower level. Um, and it was kind of funny. I started a blog at the same time that we were getting this office going because I knew that I needed to do some online marketing because I built the website and blogs at the time were great SEO fodder. And on one of my blogs, which you can, I think all the comments are still there. Uh, we had a bunch of people start commenting under anonymous uh, monikers and stuff like that. Like, hey, you're going to fail. We're, we're watching out for you. We're, you know, we're going to make sure that you never make it all this crap. And which for me fuels my fire, but I was like, what the hell is going on? But one of the interesting things was we went down to a chiropractor down the street that actually was offering us a sign to use. The sign was a giant white sign that said chiropractor. Not exactly what I want up on my business. Um, I'm proud to be a chiropractor. I don't think the generic chiropractor sign is going to do a whole lot for your business. Anyways, he had one of those for sale in his garage. So we met with him. I kindly turned him down. When I turned him down, even though he's further out than we are, but he's in Chelsea. So he's in a, a, a town city center. He looks at me and he goes, I just want to want to let you know. Um, I want you, I don't want you guys to fail, but where you're at, you're definitely not going to make it. Okay. We'll see. 
Uh, so that being said, obviously we're nine years later, I think we've done all right with the, the location choice and we're actually across the road. So if I point out this window, our old office is like right over there. Like I, it takes me like two minutes to walk over there. Now we are getting, we're going to talk about this on a later, uh, episode of this, but, uh, you know, we are moving offices close. We're going back over the mountain the other way, but it took us nine years to do that because what it was cheaper rent out here was one of the big decision makers. It's a good area. All of the urban sprawl is coming out here. Now we have the the bandwidth, the capital. We're partnering with some other people. Uh, we're going to talk about all these processes to move back over. But that's one of the decisions you need to make is like when you're looking at how much is your rent, everybody talks about location, location, location. If you're really good and you're a destination service, like how many people do you actually think that you get in is walk in traffic, right? Now, there's a subset of something to be aware of here. Like do we think people walk in? A lot of people don't even know what we are. It says the farm. And I kind of like that, especially now in the digital age, like people aren't just walking in. Uh, but there is something to be said for ease of use. If you're going to have to see somebody twice a week for a couple of weeks, how easy is it to get to your office? That's one of our struggles in this location, to be honest with you, is that if shit hits the fan, weather's bad, whatever it is, we tend to be the appointment that gets canceled on people's schedules for that day. So that is a challenge when it's uh, how easy is it to get to people and then the highway that we're on can be very traffic congested. So those are things that maybe I didn't have a lot of foresight on. Um, it's affected us a little bit, but not enough to obviously break the business. So let's back up to the credit line uh, through PNC. As I've been in practice, so we did a small business administration loan, which those are backed up by uh, you know any one number of banks. SBA loans basically chain you to that loan for the duration of the loan or however fast you can pay it off. What that means is you cannot get any other business loan while you have an, S an SBA loan. You have to pay that sucker off or you're going to go get any more money, which if you're looking to grow a business, open a second business can be a huge detriment. So that's something to be aware of. Credit lines always trump business loans. Why? Well, you're not on the hook for the money, right? You have access to the money. It's basically a credit card in loan form. It's money that's sitting there waiting. Um, sometimes it has a little bit higher rate, like my credit line, I think right now, I, I could. we just applied for a new one, we'll see. Um, I think they're around 4%, which is pretty decent. 5% uh, would be the probably industry standard. Uh, but getting a credit line also when you go to apply for other things is an open line of revolving credit rather than a loan that is, goes on your liability sheet. And I hope that makes sense to everybody, right? Like if you have a credit card and you use it moderately, that helps uh, lenders when they look at your lending scenario to say like, hey, he has access to $50,000. He uses a little bit and pays it off. Uh, same thing with a credit card. Credit cards are a little more volatile for two reasons. People tend to use them a little more irresponsibly than credit lines. Um, so they're a little easier to get and they usually have a higher APR. So those would be the two things alone. Again, you're on the hook. So if you could open a practice harder to get a credit line right out the get go of a large enough amount, but if you could get a credit line of like $50,000 and pull off that, um, in my opinion, that's much better. Now you do have to be paying that back. Otherwise the rates start going up, but you can pay it back on your own terms and you just have to find out what those minimum payments are and things like that. So if I was to go back, and again, I don't know if I would based on lending scenario, I would maybe try to really hard to track down like a couple credit lines or one big credit line to take care of the business rather than doing that SBA loan. Still worked out, just you learn lessons. Um, second thing is, as we got going, um, I think a lot of people, maybe not anymore, but I think a lot of people get lured into this idea that you need all these professionals to help you, all right? Now I did have this SBDCA group help me, but that was nonprofit. That was free. Um, we have, I say never, we've never used a lawyer until we had to have a private scenario with a contractor for our house. Um, we never used a lawyer for anything, right? I did all of the paperwork and it's not like, Oh, pat myself on the back. It's really easy to do this stuff, especially nowadays. And I didn't use legal zoom or anything. Like when we file for an LLC, you go to the Secretary of State website for Alabama, you print off the form, you fill it out, you find a notary and you drive your butt down to um, the courthouse and you turn it. In. And then you turn that into the state board. It's a little bit different in every state, but it's not that hard. Um, and I'm gonna talk about corporate formation here in a second. From an accounting standpoint, we made, let me tell you a couple huge mistakes we made so you can learn from them. 
Uh, we got an accountant. We were in a bunch of networking groups in the beginning and we used an accountant that's a larger account, not huge, but a bigger accountant um, compared to what we need, uh, knowing what we know now. And basically they wanted to put us on a retainer of $3,000 a year. And that included tax returns and everything. Well, I've never used an accountant, so that sounded fine. The one good thing that they did do is they helped us set up our QuickBooks, which is pretty easy, but basically setting up all your ledgers, your charts. Um, they did walk us through that and then they checked in with us every once in a while. But basically when it came down to, to do our taxes, we got lost in the mix because $3,000 retainer was their lowest end. So when we needed stuff to happen, we were the low man on the totem pole. Nobody answered the questions. Um, yeah, it, basically they just didn't care. So we left that scenario. The next account we used, uh, we knew through mutual friends, through a uh, gym that we go to. And we're like, man, now we know this guy. He works with smaller businesses. Uh, he was basically cutting the price in half. Uh, so we're like, this is awesome. Now, here's the biggest learning lesson. I'm not going to say don't do business with friends because this was just an acquaintance. It's not like we went to lunch or dinner with this guy. But when, it, when we first entered that uh, scenario, we were two years into practice. So we knew that we were going to have to change corporate structure at some point. So let me explain this real quick. So we started out as a, a typical LLC, right? And we can talk about our contractors and what they do uh, later, but we started out as an LLC. Well, and as an LLC all of your payroll, which are basically corporate draws, so I just take money out of the practice as needed, is taxed at a fairly high rate, right? Uh, at the time for us, it was 30%. So as those draws are coming out, you have to basically be aware that you're not paying taxes for those up front. You have to hold back enough money to pay all those taxes at the end of the year. So we knew that at some point we wanted to switch when we had enough, when we actually had profit coming in, that we wanted to switch from an LLC to an S Corp. An S Corp allows you the freedom to pay yourself as an employee, which has the benefit of paying uh, payroll tax as you go. Uh, so you're not having to hedge your bets at the end of the year and get hit with a huge tax bill. But then you also get to uh, basically be a K-1 schedule employee, which means at the end of the year, from a profit standpoint, now you can take corporate draws. We take those corporate draws at half of what you would have at the LLC rate or around half, right? So for us, a K-1 schedule pull is 15% tax versus 30, huge savings. So you basically pay yourself a, uh, a normative salary, right? There's normative data per your state and you can't pay yourself too low of a salary to save on um, the payroll tax because IRS will come knock on your door. You don't wanna pay too much because then you just pay a shitload of money in taxes. So you pay yourself a, a modicum of salary and then at the end of the year, if you have profit, you can take that draw or throughout the year you can be taking draws. So when we entered this negotiations with the second accountant, we said, hey, we know we're gonna need to switch to the CES Corp. And he goes, he was kind of looking at our stuff. He goes, well, because um, the first two years of practice, we were on losses, right? You're basically, we got this loan of 100,000 until that 100,000 is eaten, you're claiming losses on your taxes. So you don't pay any taxes until you've kind of like broke even at 100 grand. So about year 1.5, we, we broke over that 100,000, which seems like that took a long time. Well also realized that like other things are happening at the same time. Actually, I think it took us 12 months. Yeah, it took 12 months to do that. Going into the next year though, then it's, do you show a profit? And we'll get into that maybe later on how you account, like, because how your books look will determine like, Hey, what was your net income for the year? All that stuff, which is, you want to vary those based on what your goals are. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, so he said, well, let's look at the end of this year. This is going to the end, end of year two. He goes, let's look at the end of this year and make sure that we do want to do that. Well, we killed it that year. And we told him that we may kill it. He said, ah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Well, we show up for our tax return meeting and he pulls up. First of all, he pulls up our tax return. It was not our tax return. It was another chiropractor in town. Big mistake on his part. Uh, but also opened my eyes to, holy cow, that guy is working by himself. and He made a shitload of money. Anyways, uh, he pulls up our stuff and he goes, all right, go through. He goes, well, the good news is you guys made a ton of money. He goes, the bad news is since you made a ton of money, you owe a ton of taxes. And we're like, what do you mean? And he had told us to set aside, he estimated like five to $7,000. I'm like, okay. So he goes, well, yeah, you're kind of in the ballpark of like $25,000 in taxes. We don't have $25,000. And I have an immediate like, 
I think I had a little TIA and I kind of look at him. I was like, what happened to the five to $7,000 mark? He goes, well, you guys did better than you thought you were. And I go, do you remember when we said that we thought we were going to do really good and we wanted to go ahead and file for the S Corp? How come we didn't do that? And he goes, well, don't worry about them. We'll get them next year. Can you imagine if somebody walked them in back pain and you just kind of like adjust them and send them out the door and then they come back in. Uh, they're like, I'm worse. And then you do that like a bunch of times. You're like, ah, we'll, we'll get it next time. Don't worry about it. We'll get it next time. To say that I was pissed, uh, doesn't he fully explain it. Uh, so we walk out of there like, how the hell are we going to pay this? Uh, when are we firing this guy? So moving forward, we got on a payment plan. We actually paid that off in a couple months. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Luckily, we were making a decent amount of money at that time. So moving forward, I started asking around about accountants and we found an accountant who was amazing charges the same amount of money per year is the second accountant, which was about $1,700 a year. That's for just tax returns. That's one of the things I want to talk about here in a second. He also took it upon himself to go back and charge the old accountant, like bill him for all of the things he had to fix on our accounting records, um, which got us, I think like $2,500 back, not a ton, but some money. Also, the first year that we used him as an accountant, which was four years into practice, which we did turn a profit, we've gotten money back now three years and we're turning profit because of how we, we negotiate our corporate structure into an S corp and how you make, how you have your books uh, project your profits for end of year. So we're getting, not only are we not spending $25,000 out, we've gotten money back numerous years. And yeah, we pay quarterly, uh, into you know state and federal taxes, but we've gotten money back numerous times. So you've got to do your due diligence. The big thing with accountants though is, so if we pay $1,700 a year, the thing that you do not need to do, like you do not need a lawyer, is you don't need an accountant that you can like call the time. You don't need them to be looking over your books. I don't think most people need a bookkeeper because QuickBooks is really easy. You want to learn how to do these things like filing corporate formations, uh, in my opinion, I'll say why here in a second. I know some people disagree with me in the business realm. Uh, looking over your QuickBooks so you know what your financial position is, which is extremely easy. It's time effective. It literally, total time spent on accounting per month for me is probably less than an hour. And that's reconciling everything, maybe in a year a little bit more, not a whole lot at all. But what's it allow me to do? It see, lets me see cash position. How are we doing? Making sure everything's good. It just makes me feel more comfortable with what we're doing rather than, Somebody's my bookkeeper. I get to see in a month projections. I see my tax returns into there. I don't think that's a good way to operate. Now, I realize that some people would argue you want to outsource everything you can. Well, I get that. But also, what if shit hits the fan and you have to get lean, which is what happened during COVID? And I was able to basically just take a practice that was doing really well, shrink down everything, run it all back in house, and basically be like, I don't have to have anybody help me if I don't need to. Now that's how I'm built, right? I've built our website. I do most of everything in the business I've done at one point and can do. And yeah, now we have two full-time employees, a bunch of their doctors, all this stuff. But like, if you don't know how to do all the things that you're supposed to teach other people how to do, like, how are you going to teach them? And what if that person quits one day or shit hits the fan, whatever it is, like you need to like have a full spectrum understanding of your practice. Um, from the financial perspective, you are running a business. So if it takes you 15 minutes a week to overlook uh, QuickBooks and enter data and check on your accounts and stuff, I think it pays dividends in the long run because you're also learning. So if you go to make bigger deals, you kind of know how finances work a little bit better. Uh, so that's kind of my, uh, so we went over like credit lines versus loans. Uh, do you need a professional? Last thing I want to talk about. So uh, like I said, so we've set up, we got these loans, we got into practice, uh, we're learning the ropes. Uh, we networked like bandwidth bandits, right? Like my advice here is network until you feel awkward. What I mean by that is like, I did all of the cheesy stuff in the beginning. I would take business cards to dinner, put my business card in the leather folio with the bill when I paid it. Who cares if they call me cool? I don't know if anybody, I think I had one person that called. Um, I was always wearing something that said the farm, talking about what I did. Obviously we work a ton of events. Now, this is something that I've kind of propped ourselves up on proudly, right or wrong. 
right? Maybe if I would have spent more money, it would work out better. Total, total for nine years, putting money towards true advertising. I'm saying, you know, like we put these jackets in an advertising budget. I don't consider that part of like advertising. What I consider advertising is I paid for an ad, a radio spot, sponsoring a race, uh, something online. I think we've, I know we've paid much less than $15,000, right? And the old adage was you put at least 15% of your annual budget into advertising. Well, it's also not, you know, 1990s. Uh, with social media, a good website, being savvy with SEO, YouTube was a huge thing for us. Uh, working events was the biggest thing in the world, right? Getting out in front of people. And we worked all sorts of events, uh, church health fairs, corporate health fairs, any kind of talk at any kind of gym setting, whatever, uh, having clinics and classes in the farm for general public, uh, going to races, CrossFit competitions, all these things, that was the biggest thing in the world. And we also largely negotiated with things like races and CrossFit competitions, which always want you to pay a sponsorship. It's usually like minimum 500 bucks that I always said, Hey, we're a value added service. Like we come there, we treat minor injuries. We, we add value to your event by offering stretching, soft tissue, minor injury care. Uh, so we're not going to pay the sponsorship fee. Now, sometimes you get into bigger events, there's going to be like three PTs and another Cairo, and you're going to pay if you want to be there. We've done that a few times. I don't think it's worth the pay because I'll just go to all these other events and see three to 500 people pull 10 new patients out of it. And that was free. All right. Besides my time. Um, so there's so much that you can do where you're not paying for traditional advertising nowadays that like, should you do a practice on a shoestring budget? No, not completely, but like spend your money on the things that you need to spend money on, which is maybe really good staff. Uh, you know, I mean, really your money is spent on like, you know, just making things run as smoothly as you can in the office. That's where like, you know, here we just are trimming down. I'll save some of this for another episode, but you know, we were using Cairo touch and review wave and we built a farm app and we had all these things going and we're actually trimming all this stuff down. We're kind of stripping it away and switching software systems and getting rid of some stuff. And, um, I can talk about numerous aspects of the business, but I just kind of wanted to like go through the beginning phases of like, well, how did we start out? How did we grab some financing? Um, I can talk about numerous struggles. The last one that I want to talk about is another failure point of ours that uh, I want to say it about this. I think it was about the seven month mark in practice. So we hit the the ground running. So we had done all this pre-marketing. We were working races before we even had an office open, which was kind of awkward because people would be like, well, hey, I'd be at a race working on me. Like, where can, where can I come see you? Like, you can't because we're not even open yet. But that's how gung ho we were with marketing. But when we opened, because we did that, we hit the ground running and we were just, you know, off and getting after it. So like six months into practice, we thought we were just doing awesome, right? We got money in the bank. We're paying ourselves, all this stuff. Well, we got extremely busy, right? For us, I mean, we were seeing like 14, 15 patients a day each. So there's like 30 people coming through the office, which for a rehab based practice like ours at that time, right out the get go, go was a lot or, you know, making money, there's money in the savings account, all this stuff's happening, but we get so busy, we stopped marketing as much. So we stopped going to these network, uh, like networking groups, BNI. So like, I don't have time. I have to go see patients. Uh, well, there was like two months of that. And then all of a sudden I was like, dude, we're not doing so awesome. Like there's less new patients. Uh, what's going on? It was like, Oh, we're not getting out there. We're not in the community. We're not in the gym because we're so busy, all these things. And we just had to kind of flip the switch and be like, you know, uh, Rich Holm was, was saying this at our seminar here that like, you know, you don't go fishing when the fish are uh, not biting, you go fishing when the fish are biting, like you want to keep going, right? Even when it looks good. So I, maybe I messed that analogy up. I don't know. Somebody correct me on that. I feel like that just sounded absolutely asinine. But anyways, uh, yeah, so that's kind of our start where we're at. Uh, like I said, moving forward in time, some of the things I'm going to break down is, uh, you know, in depth with marketing strategy, like how did I go about like creating a, the brand and how did we go about upholding the brand? What are some interesting things we did? What things worked? What didn't? Um, staff, right? We've been through a bunch of different iterations of 
types of people we had in here, things that we've tried. Like I'm open, an open book for this stuff, but I'm just going to break down all of the, the business because again, we're going on almost a decade moving offices, partnering with a PT about ready to open a gym. So we're going from this like 1100 square foot office with just me and Sloan because it was just Sloan and I for the first three weeks until Bridget got there um, to, you know, an office that's going to be full of almost like, you know, next year, like 20 employees total. Um, so it's just, it's getting pretty big. Uh, big's always not, not always great. It's not always good. You have to, one thing that Sloan and I have discussed recently is, can we get really clear on what we want this thing to be? Right? Like, uh, how big do we want to get? The bigger you get, the more, uh, risk there is, uh, just because it's bigger doesn't mean it's better. You got to make sure that you can deliver on value, um, as you scale, which gets really tough in our world because we're still seeing people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And we have to make sure that like, we have a viable, uh, business model that allows us to make enough money to obviously pay ourselves, keep the business running with offering that value. But in my opinion, that's one of the things that we we'll definitely talk about in this is like, how do you scale our types of practices? And I am saying like a rehab based practice to where you can make a really good living. And I just don't think you're going to do it by seeing more patients and staying in a small practice. I think you have to grow your practice overall. So let me know how you like these off week business episodes. Um, my goal is to have these mainly be business this go around. Um, that's what a lot of people wanted to hear last time. So that's what I'm going to give you. Um, and then on our grand rounds week, I'll try to be far more clinical and we'll just get that good mix in there that way. Uh, make sure that you are putting comments in the forum um, on Facebook. That just kind of lets me know, hey, what do you want to know? But also get some discussion drummed up and it just makes everything better. And I'll see you guys next week at Grand Rounds.